to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, our Lord says these powerful words about service. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. We welcome you today to our study of the Gospel of Mark, the majesty of Jesus Christ. Today we're going to be studying, overviewing Mark chapters 9 through 12, and we want to make sure that you've got your Bible handy as we're going to be looking to the Word of God together in our study. Today's lesson is being brought to you by members and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Lord's Church in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether on Sunday morning or Sunday night or for Wednesday Bible study, they'd be happy to have you come as an honored guest. If you'd like to study more about the Word of God or you've got questions about the church or the plan of salvation, whatever it may be, they'd be more than happy to sit down with you, open up the Scriptures, and let God's voice be heard on the matter. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also love to help you in your study of the Word of God, we want to encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From our website, you can access all our videos, all our audios, transcripts, study questions. There is a wide variety of Bible study materials in which we try to help men and women come to a better knowledge of or to study, aid them in studying the Word of God. And if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether it be on video or audio, we'd be happy to make that available to you free of charge. You can download those from our website, or if you need a hard copy, just fill out a media request form and we'll put that to you in the mail free of charge as well. And we want to encourage you also in today's day and age to check out our apps, both on the Google Store and the Apple Store. They're free of charge for Android and iPhone, and we'd love to have you download that as well in studying the Word of God as you move along in your daily life. All right, let's think today about Mark chapters 9 through 12. Jesus, as we have mentioned, in the Gospel of Mark, writing to the Roman mind, is presented as active. There is a high intensity and energy level in everything Jesus does as the ultimate King of kings and Lord of lords. And now... Jesus is going to begin to discuss and show the characteristics of His kingdom as well. In fact, in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus will tell His disciples something very interesting about when the kingdom would be set up. Notice the words of Mark 9, verse 1. And He said to them, to His immediate disciples, Assuredly I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. And so Jesus is in the midst of these disciples who've just seen many of His great miracles and He says this, not only do I want you to realize my power that I am king, but you need to know something about my kingdom. There's some of you right here today who are not going to taste death. You're not going to die until, listen to the adverb of time, until you see the kingdom of God present here and with power. Now friend, that helps us a lot in understanding about the Lord's kingdom. When did Jesus say His kingdom was going to be set up? Well, He clearly taught that it would be in the generation of his disciples, before some of these people who heard Jesus in Mark 9 verse 1 die, you're going to see the kingdom of God here and with power. And so friend, as we think about the kingdom, please understand the kingdom is not a future event, a thousand years or 
a long time from now. It's not as though the kingdom is something still coming. If that's the view we take, then we find ourselves in a very serious problem. Either Jesus told something that didn't happen, or you've got some really old disciples running around. And friend, we know neither one of those are true. God can't lie, and these men died. What's the case then? The kingdom was set up in the first century. And we know that happened. Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, after Peter has made that great statement, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus turned to him and said, uh, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you're Peter, and on this rock, you're a small stone, but on this bedrock, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. I'll build my church. And then listen to this. And he said to Peter, I'm going to give to you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will already be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will already be loosed in heaven. Well, when did Peter take that key and open up the door for the kingdom. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter stood up with the eleven by the power of the Holy Spirit and preached, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God's made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. They cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The answer was clarion. Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And listen to Acts 2 verse 47. Those who gladly received His word were baptized. Acts 2 verse 42. And verse 47 says this, For the very first time, the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. When Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom, when Peter took those keys, the gospel message, opened up the door, and men and women came into the church, which is the kingdom, and friend, the Lord's kingdom was set up in the lifetime of of the apostles. As you will study in the New Testament, church and kingdom are used synonymously because if Christ is the head of the church, then friend, that's the domain of the king, our king, Lord and Lord, Lord of Lord and King of Kings, Jesus Christ. And so the kingdom, it's not a future event. It's here. It's a reality. It exists today, and one day, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 24, the kingdom is going to be returned to the Father and those who are in the kingdom are those who will live with God for all eternity. And then right on the heels of Mark chapter 9, verse 1, we see this marvelous event showing Jesus has the power to set up His kingdom. Jesus takes uh, Peter, James, and John up on that high mountain with Him. And there He is transfigured before them. He begins to shine. His clothes become so white, no launderer could whiten them, the Bible tells us. And, and Peter, as was often the case, they got afraid. And Peter didn't know what to say, so he kind of blurted something out. Uh, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. One of the accounts tells us, before he even got those words all the way out of his mouth, a voice boomed down from heaven saying, This, not Moses, not Elijah, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear Him. Jesus is the one who we need to listen to, and that's what God says. He said that from heaven in the first century, and He says that today to us by His Word. And so when Jesus teaches us, we need to listen up. And we need to realize that's the one God has approved to give His message to mankind today. And friend, as we think about that message, there is a sense of urgency by which we need to listen to Christ. Because friends, those who don't listen to God and those who don't obey the gospel, sadly, they will be lost for all eternity in that horrible place we know of as hell. How do we know that? That's what Jesus says in Mark chapter 9. I want you to direct your attention to Jesus. Jesus spoke more about hell than any other person in the New Testament. And He spoke about it with great urgency and clarity because He didn't want men to go there. Listen to what He says in Mark chapter 9. I want you to notice the words of Jesus in verse number uh, 46. Jesus said, there's a place called hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Verse 45. Now verse 46, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Why is there such a sense of urgency? 
to get in the kingdom of Christ, to realize He's the one we need to listen to today, to recognize and honor His majesty and power. Friend, not only because of the beauty and the splendor and the wonder of heaven, we all want to go there, but because there is a place called hell. It is a place of horrible agony and anguish and, and terror that nobody would want to go to. It's a place, Jesus said, where the fire is not quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. I want you to think about that language and the graphic nature of that. The word hell is from the Greek word Gehenna. Under the Old Testament, it represented the Valley of the Sons of Hinnon. Uh, during the day of Jesus, it had basically become a refuse dump in His day and age. And as you read the history of that, because of the, the rot and the decay and the filth, there was always gases coming out of that and there was a continual fire burning in that place. And Jesus used that word, the Valley of the Sons of Hinnon, Gehenna, to describe that place we know of as hell. And He said, the worm never dies. That Greek word for worm is not your little worm you put on your fishing hook. We're not talking about an earthworm that you go fishing with. That Greek word for worm would be equivalent to our word maggot. It, what's hell like? It's a place as though there were always a continual maggot eating on your flesh and nobody ever reaches over and turns down the AC. Can you imagine? Why is there such a sense of urgency in listening to Christ? Friend, hell is real. And nobody in their right mind would want to go there. Then in Mark chapter 10, Jesus is going to turn His attention to more about the kingdom, uh, His kingdom, and what the citizens of His kingdom are going to be like. And Jesus now teaches us that to really be the type of, of Christian citizens in, in His kingdom that we need to be, we've got to have the right attitude and mindset. And that's seen. In Mark chapter 10, verse 14, look at what the Lord says here. In Mark 10, verse 14, our Lord says, When Jesus saw it, the, uh, the disciples uh, arguing and bickering and not wanting these children to come to Jesus, when Jesus saw it, He was greatly displeased and said to them, Let the little children come to Me, and do not forbid them. Now listen to this. For of such is the kingdom of God. What are people inside the kingdom of God like? They're childlike in the sense that they know the power of God. They realize that God has their best interest at heart. And whatever God says, we do that because we know He has our protection and our best interest at heart. We wholeheartedly, lovingly, and willingly submit to God, our Father, as king of the kingdom and as his children. And that's the attitude and the mindset. Not rebellious, not rising up against, not always questioning God's authority. No, we're childlike. We have that sense of attitude and mindset. Just like a, a little child knows how much his father loves him, uh, will do anything for the father. That's the mindset Christians, citizens in the kingdom of God should have today. My friend, we're introduced next to probably one of the saddest verses in all of the Bible. A man has heard about Jesus. He's seen his miracles. He's uh, evidenced his teaching. He knows the power of Christ. And he has the greatest question on, my, on his mind that one could ever ask. Good teacher, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to go to heaven? And Jesus is going to say to this man, keep the commandments. Do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not lie. That man will say, all those things I've done from childhood. And Jesus will say one thing you lack. Sell what you have, give to the poor, come follow me. And I want you to watch the response of this man in Mark chapter 10, verse 22. The Bible says, but the rich young ruler was sad. He was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Here's a man who's got the greatest question on his mind that you could ever have. What do I need to do to go to heaven? He comes to the right person, Jesus Christ. He listens to what Jesus has to say. And with the majority of that, he either agrees or is already doing. But when he gets down to making changes 
and really putting God first. This man doesn't do it. He went away sad. It broke his heart. He probably knew it was right, and he knew he needed to do it. He went away sad at his word because he had great possessions. That man let the world's goods and the stuff of this world keep him from heaven. Friend, don't let that be me and you. Let's make sure that we don't get so attached to the things of this world that we can't put Christ and His kingdom first. This reminds me of another man in the Bible. Luke chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. There's a man we know of here as a rich fool. This man came to Jesus and uh, uh, he, he's talking to Christ and uh, Jesus is going to give an illustration here from this man's life. A uh, man had a great crop year. Again, to say to himself, Soul, you've got many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Uh, in essence, eat, drink, be merry. And that man thought he had it all. But you know what? God said to that man, You fool, this night will your soul be required of you. Then whose things will those be whom you've acquired? And here's the point. So is he who is rich, but not in godliness or not toward God. That man had it all. Uh, had a great crop year able to build bigger barns. You think about living on easy street and that man was doing it. But you know what he forgot? The most important thing. He died that night. Uh-oh, I haven't taken care of my soul. I've taken care of my crops. I've taken care of my houses. I've taken care of my investments. My bank account's as big as you can imagine. But the one thing that was most important, he left out. You fool, this night will your soul be required of you. What about all this stuff then? Won't be yours. Friend, what's the point Jesus is making here? If you've got it going your way, if everything looks good, but you forget about your soul, the most important thing, you are in all kindness and love. You are the biggest fool. You are making one of the most foolish decisions. We mean this as kindly as we know how now. If you leave out taking care of your soul, you are making one of the most foolish decisions you've ever made because the soul is what's going to live beyond this life and all that God has given to us. And so what a powerful lesson the Lord teaches us there. And then on top of that, Jesus will teach about the power and the temptation of riches and not letting those cloud what's really important. Listen to the words of Jesus in Mark chapter 10, verse number 25. What does Jesus say to his disciples on the heels of, the, of this? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus is not saying it can't be done. Jesus is not saying it's impossible, but he uses this really unique illustration. Camel going through the eye of a needle. Something really large going through something really small that is nearly impossible. Not impossible, but it's very difficult. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Not saying it can happen, but his whole point is this. Don't let riches and things and stuff and money cloud your judgment. Now friend, don't get me wrong. There are good, righteous, holy people in the Bible who had money and stuff, but there's a whole bunch of them who let that stuff and that money and those pleasures get in their way. And so be very careful what we value so much and make sure that we value our soul above all else. And then that statement we began with, Mark chapter 10, verse number 45, we're introduced to Jesus the servant of all. Jesus says this. Think about this. The Creator, the Son of God, the Savior, the one who made the ultimate sacrifice, God in the flesh on this earth said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give His life a ransom for many. Do you know what's going on in that context? Here's the problem. There is bickering among the disciples of Jesus. And some want to sit on the right hand and the left. They want to know who's going to be first and who's going to be greatest in the kingdom. Jesus will say, the first will be last, the last will be first. You want to run to the front of the line in my kingdom? That's not the way it works. How do you become great 
in the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, follow my example. Don't come here to be served. Don't sit at the table and sit back and say, what can you do for me? Rather, you get out and say, what can I do for the kingdom of God? How can I serve? Not how can I be served. How can I serve? How can I let God use me? What can I do for the kingdom of Christ? 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Now, from this point forward, we're going to see Jesus ushered in to preparing for His death and the ultimate uh, setup of His kingdom. Mark chapter 11 Jesus is now going to be seen as King of Kings as He rides in on that triumphal entry. They begin to lay down palm leaves. They begin to cry out, Hosanna in the highest. Jesus rides in on that colt, uh, the foal of a donkey, and He's presented in that kingly state. And, and at this point, they're ready to take Jesus and, as it were, make Him King, but His time's not ready yet. And so Jesus is ushered into that triumphal entry that we see in Mark chapter 11. But there are some things that happen among the religious elite. They begin to get jealous. They begin to become envious of Jesus. And Jesus has to address their false teaching. That will ultimately lead to Jesus being put to death. In Mark chapter 12, I want you to notice how Jesus addresses the false teaching of the people of His day. Look in Mark chapter 12, verse number 24. There were some who did not believe in the resurrection, the Sadducees. And Jesus said to them in verse 24, Are you not therefore mistaken? Because you do not know the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Jesus was not bashful in saying what needed to be said. Jesus clearly stood up to these false teachers and He said, You don't know the Bible, you don't know the Scriptures, and you don't know God's power. Don't say there's not a resurrection because God's already said it. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Because you don't know the Bible and you don't know the power of God, you've denied the resurrection of God. And so in dealing with error, many of these people will turn against Jesus. But that didn't cause Jesus to lose sight of some of the greatest things ever. And a, a lawyer in this context, a scribe of the law, is now going to, after hearing Jesus deal with these Sadducees and so candidly from the Scriptures set them back on their heels, this law, who, this scribe who's been studying the law all his life, now sees somebody who can answer his greatest question. And so he comes to Jesus. Good teacher, what is the greatest commandment of all? And Jesus will address that. Look in Mark chapter 12, verse 30. What is the single most important? What is the first of all commandments? Mark 12, verse 30. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And so when we think about uh, the greatest commandments, the things that God has said that are some of the most important, what are they? Love God and love others. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Friend, if I really love God like I ought to, I'm going to follow God, I'm going to obey God, I'm going to live for God, I'm going to do my best to live a life that's free of sin. I'm going to worship God how He tells me to. I'm going to stand up for God. And friend, if I really love God, I'm going to love my neighbor as myself. I'm not going to talk ugly about them. I'm going to try to help those who are in need. I'm going to try to do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. I'm really going, if I love God and I love others, I'm going to be the type of person God wants me to be. And in listening to all these teachings, one of my favorite statements about the Lord Jesus Christ is said in Mark 12, verse 37. This is such a wonderful statement about Jesus as a preacher. Mark 12, verse 37 says this, Therefore David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the New King James says this, And the common people heard him gladly. You know, when I think about that statement about our Lord's life and His teaching, that impresses me so much. Who heard Jesus gladly? 
the doctors, the lawyers, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious elite, the common people heard him gladly. You ever wondered why the common people heard him gladly? Well, friend, those are the people Jesus was with day in and day out. They had seen his miracles. They had been fed by him. They had seen him heal people. They'd seen the good that he did. They saw his compassion. And those are the people who when Jesus spoke, they knew he was speaking the truth. The common people, the everyday people, the people that you would run into in the marketplace, those are the people that heard Jesus gladly. When we think about the message of Christ, friend, we need to realize that God wants us to submit to him and God wants us to obey him and his message appeals to those who realize how much they need God. Not the religious elite who think they're already everything they need to be, but the person who realize, I've sinned, I've erred exceedingly, I'm lost in sin. Romans 3 verse 23, there's none righteous. The person who realize, I've got sin in my life and I desperately need God. Those are the kind of people who listen up when they hear the words, Jesus is the way the truth and the life. Jesus can cleanse us of every sin. God will wipe away every... Those are people who saw the love and the, uh, the sacrifice of Jesus as so meaningful. And friend, when we think about that, we each need to realize how we need our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Do you realize today that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Do you realize if all have sinned, I have sinned, you've sinned, we're in desperate need of God's grace and God's love. Are you willing to accept Jesus as Savior of the world? John 8 verse 24. Would you be willing to turn from sin and turn to God? Luke 13 verse 5. Would you make that confession? Acts chapter 8 verse 36 and 37. I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And to have every sin washed away, would you repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins? Acts 2 verse 38. Friend, we hope that you'll join us next week as we're going to study the very last chapters in the Gospel of Mark about the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Won't you join us then? You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.